Morning, friends. We are on chapter 30, The Man in the Heartland, Columbus, Ohio. The city of Columbus, Ohio, in many ways, is a fine replica of the United States. Its income and age distribution, its racial demographics and diversity of opinion, make Columbus a microcosm of America, and one that marketers especially prize. There's a large white population and moderate number of blacks. Unlike other parts of Ohio, Columbus has a sizable immigrant groups from Mexico, Somalia, Nepal, and other parts of Asia, who flock to town to fill the low-end service jobs. A large col college student population at Ohio State and other schools has kept it vibrant and edgy. No place apparently represents the country more faithfully, and for that reason, Columbus, Ohio has been known as the test market capital of the United States for several years now. These days, it's no longer Peoria, but Columbus that marketers use as a barometer for, of America. White Castle and Wendy's and more than a dozen other fast food chains headquarter there. Many companies have used the town to gauge interest in new product offerings, placing them in stores in Columbus first before rolling out those products nationally. McDonald's tested its McRib in Columbus, and Wendy's and Panera have tested prototype stores there as well. Taco Bell's BLT tacos were tested in the Columbus market. R.J. Reynolds tried tobacco in the form of a mint that did away with secondhand smoke. Giant Eagle's massive market district supermarket in Columbus tests a variety of concepts, among them the sale of wine by the glass. If you raked America together in the center, you'd find Columbus. And I think that's really what makes us a unique test bed as opposed to being average. A spokesman for the Columbus Partnership told CBS News in a story in which the reporter concluded, what they choose in Columbus today may very well determine what you will buy tomorrow. By the end of 1998, the man was proving that true of black tar heroin as well, for the bounties of Columbus, he discovered, were indeed ample. A metro area of close to two million, Columbus wasn't Youngstown or Cleveland. It had no organized mafias or armed gangs controlling the drug underworld. It was connected by freeways to regional markets as far east as Wheeling, West Virginia, and south to Lexington and eastern Kentucky. There was Cincinnati to the southwest. Plus, all around it were suburbs and farm towns with money. Columbus always was a highly educated community with a service, not industrial economy, as parts of the state went into something like permanent recession. In Columbus, the suburbs spread and the malls stayed busy. All this the man saw upon arriving in the summer of 1998, which seems to be the first time Mexican black tar heroin made a large and sustained appearance east of the Mississippi River. Up to then, the Colombian powder was all Columbus dealers could get, usually by driving to New York City and diluting it before the sale. They were stepping on it five or six times, the man said. Addicts would buy a $100 bag twice a day just as get well. They'd buy a $40 bag of mine and stay well all day. Mexico's proximity and his connection to the Nayarit poppy supply and Jalisco cookers meant that he got the heroin quickly, cheaply, and unadulterated. Enormously potent dope could be sold at scarily low prices. This gave black tar a competitive advantage over heroin from Colombia, Mexico's main heroin competition, and of course, what little arrived from Asia. He immediately sent for two more kids from Jalisco, so now he had three. He brought out a woman from California who rented two apartments in her name, one for the workers and one for him. He found a car lot with an amenable owner. Every two months he switched cars. He exchanged an old Honda Accord for a Prelude, and that for a Civic, and then for a Camry. White, beige, gray. He ran two ships of drivers, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. They devised codes for places to meet the addicts. One was a Burger King, two a Kmart parking lot. He tutored his new Jalisco boys, never leave the house with anything in your pockets, take only what you can swallow if you get pulled over, and never carry a gun. An illegal who is arrested gets deported, an illegal with a gun gets ten years. Some of them still dressed as they had back home, with cowboy boots and belt buckles. Go to the stores downtown, he told two of them one day. Look at how they dress the mannequins at J.C. Penney's. Buy, buy clothes like that so you blend in with the people here. He insisted they send money home weekly. Most didn't need to be told and religiously sent money to mom via Western, Western Union. Those who didn't, he knew he would be hearing from their parents. For some kids, he sent the money to their parents' house for them, himself. Sell to whites, that's where the money is, he told them. Steer clear of blacks. He didn't have to insist too strongly on this point either. His runners came with their own ideas forged by the negative view of black people common in Mexico culture that was, in turn, reinforced by the stories of returning in immigrants who lived in Compton, Watts, and South Central Los Angeles, where powerful black gangs, gangs terrorized vulnerable Mexicans. 
So the Jalisco boys stayed away from black neighborhoods, and this one was one reason why, as their system expanded, Nayarit black tar was primarily sold to and used by whites. Otherwise, he had a live-and-let-live live attitude. The U.S. market was large enough, and tar heroin was addictive enough. It never occurred to him to sell wholesale. Retail, he made almost triple what he would have made selling heroin wholesale. He had a bunch of poor ranchero kids down in Nayarit eager to drive around with tiny balloons in their mouths, so his risk was minimal, and they were only deported when arrested because they usually possessed such small quantities of dope. Selling small quantities allowed him to get the most money out of the dope he got from Mexico. Plus, as he hired more of these men, his standing in Jalisco improved, and he got respect every time he returned. Columbus had been at the bottom of Ohio's heroin distribution chain. At the time the men arrived, heroin in Columbus was at most 3% pure, old addicts told me, and even that was hard to get. For years before his arrival in the entire city of Columbus, Ohio, heroin was sold at precisely one street corner, Mount Vernon Avenue at North 20th Street. The city, instead, had always been a pill town. Pills were easier to trust than low-grade heroin. The advent of black tar heroin in this community suddenly put a much purer-grade heroin on the streets of central Ohio, said Ronnie Pogue, co-founder of Columbus's lone methadone clin clinic, Comp Drug. The hunger for heroin, which had always been there, immediately saw an upward spike because you also saw a spike in the overdose rate. Columbus had the only methadone clinic for hundreds of miles around. Long before the man arrived, the region's opiate addicts had been traveling into Columbus to score whatever they could find in front of the clinic. As word spread of the high-quality black tar, these pilgrims became some of his first clients. Users from Zanesville, Toledo, Chillicothe, from northern Kentucky and west, western West Virginia. Some of his best clients were from Ashland, Ashland, Kentucky, who had bought for years in front of Columbus's methadone clinic. They bought his tar and went back to Ashland and sold it for triple. Black tar became the talk of Columbus's drug underworld. It was the most powerful heroin anyone had tried. Plus, the Mexicans soon had a delivery driver in each area. With that, heroin found its way to suburban kids. They broke the city down into dominoes, 30 minutes or less. One veteran addict told me, when you're dope sick, that makes a big difference. And every time you found them, somebody you found them, somebody knew it was a free balloon. Usually it was seven balloons for $100. But if you brought them enough people and were spending with them, you could get as many as 13 balloons for $100. With addicts transformed into a new sales force, the man was soon making so much money that he had to concentrate less on running the cell and more on getting cash back to Mexico. He formed a network of young women. A trailer in Los An a trailer. A tailor in Los Angeles made them corsets with pockets that held a hundred thousand dollars in cash. He sent the women on airplanes to El, El Paso, where they crossed his money to Cuidad Juarez, and from there back to Jalisco. For more than a year he sent two girls a month back to Mexico with a hundred thousand dollars in pure Columbus Columbus, Ohio profit tucked in their corsets. His product was coming in from a man named Oscar Hernandez Garcia, a member of the Tejeda clan who operated a heroin supply business out of his apartment in Panorama City in Los Angeles. Hernandez Garcia, known as Mosca Fly, had developed a business as a wholesaler, supplying black tar to Jalisco cells from Portland and Phoenix to Columbus and Hawaii. The man used Federal Express to bring the product from Mosca's apartment to Cal in California. He would go to California, buy a small electric oven from Target or Kmart, open the back of the oven, stuff it with black tar heroin, then take it to FedEx for packaging. Police didn't often search a package that FedEx prepared. He sent the ovens to a plant Columbus, to a pliant Columbus addict who lived in the basement of his senile, senile parents' home and paid him in heroin. With Columbus humming along, he looked for new markets. One addict, a kid named Mikey, told him that people in Wheeling, West Virginia, would go crazy for black tar. Mikey introduced him around Wheeling. There the man made a startling discovery. Mikey introduced him to a woman in her late thirties, a heroin addict. She showed him a bottle of pills, wanting to trade them for his tar. Oxycontin, the pills were called, she told him. He'd never heard of the name and turned her down, but it st struck him that she drove a new Dodge Durango and owned a house. He'd never known a longtime heroin addict who had a house and a new SUV, so he listened to her. Oxycontin, she told him, contained a pharmaceutical pharmaceutical opiate, a prescription painkiller similar to heroin.
He got to know the woman better. Turned out she traveled the area buying these pills cheap from seniors, then sold them to oxy addicts in the hills of Appalachia. She bought her daily heroin for, with the money. He couldn't have known it then, but arriving in 1998, he had happened onto the biggest metro area in the five-state region where, two years into the Purdue Pharma promotional campaign, opiate addiction was exploding due to abuse of this new drug called Oxycontin. By his own good fortune, not far away was Portsmouth, Ohio, where scandalous pain clinics were just starting to follow the lead of Dr. David Proctor into a new business model of writing prescriptions for millions of these, for millions of these pills to long lines of addicts. Meanwhile, the pain revolution was in full swing in U.S. medicine. Specialists were urging well-meaning doctors everywhere to prescribe opiate painkillers for pain, convinced that when used this way, they were all but non-addictive. Central Ohio, in other words, was about to be a great place to be a heroin dealer. His black tar, once it came to an area where Oxycontin had already tenderized the terrain, sold not to tapped-out old drunkies, but to younger kids, many from the suburbs, most of whom had money and all of whom were white. Their transition from oxy to heroin, he saw, was a natural and easy one. Oxy addicts began by sucking on and dissolving the pill's time-release coating. They were left with 40 or 80 milligrams of pure oxycodone. At first, addicts crushed the pills and snorted the powder. As their tolerance built, they used more. To get a bigger bang from the pill, they liquefied it and injected it. But their tolerance never stopped climbing. Oxycontin sold on the street for a dollar a milligram, and addicts very quickly were using well over a hundred milligrams a day. As they reached their fin financial limits, many switched to heroin. Since they were already shooting up oxy, they had lost any fear of the needle. Black tar was potent, far cheaper, and his delivery system made, made it easier to get than the pills. Plus, tar could be smoked. It didn't have to be injected, which attracted kids to whom needles were first at first anathema. The way he saw it, every oxy addict was a tar junkie in waiting, and there were thousands of new oxy addicts. All he had to do was work it. His neighborhood brothers might never have figured this out, like many Mexican immigrants who lived in Spanish-only enclaves. They were oblivious to settled trends in the American society and culture in which they lived. As traffickers, they cared, cared only to sell their dope and send money home. Drivers were short-timers all on... Drivers were short-timers all on salary, there for six to nine months, holed up in apartments and knowing only a few words of English, no credit, or fifteen minutes, exchanged with desperate addicts who spoke no Spanish. Discovering emerging markets required an English speaker who understood the street. Landing in Columbus, just as the region around it was becoming ground zero in America's opiate epidemic, he could see opportunities developing simply because he told me once I could talk to the white people. His arrival was a fateful coincidence. Other traffickers might have filled the eventual demand for heroin created in this region where prescription pill abuse got prescription pill abuse got bad first. Later, many did. But few were so ready to take advantage of it, so aggressive in their marketing, and so quickly replenished as the Jalisco boys and the man who brought them there. Wheeling taught the man that new markets were now everywhere the pills were. With the boys working his store in Columbus, he found a place in Carnegie, Pennsylvania, a suburb of Pittsburgh, and close enough to service other towns like Steubenville and Wheeling. He also eyed Nashville. Its Mexican population was growing, nearing 80,000 people. The town, he heard, was swamped in Oxycontin. He set up one of his Columbus drivers, along with a new kid from Jalisco, in a store that was soon booming. Choose the right town and you can't miss, he thought to himself. The Nashville store covered his expenses for the expansion he eyed throughout the Mid-South. At the urging of another addict, he took a trip down to Virginia through Roanoke, Richmond, and Newport News. It was another large market, but the federal government had too many installations there. Langley and a naval base made him nervous. He went through Chattanooga, Tennessee, a town with a lively underworld but too small. Mex Mexicans and cars would stand out. He drove down to Pensacola and Jacksonville, but left. Florida is dominated by Colombians and Cubans and Puerto Ricans, that kind of race, they ain't got no understanding, he said. Kill, kill, kill. They think they can solve anything by killing. I wasn't going to kill nobody over drugs. He'd probably be buried the rest of my life in prison. He nixed Philadelphia, too. It had a huge heroin market, but it was run by the mafia and street gangs. He didn't even consider New York or Baltimore. It was crazy to think that a bunch of Mexican farm boys, farm boys could break in there. Why would they want to? The country was full of towns like Columbus, wealthy places with growing numbers of addicts and no competition. 
so the contours of the Jalisco heroine nation took shape, based largely on the territory the man carved out by avoiding the biggest cities where heroin markets were already controlled and by following the Oxycontin. He tried to keep his eastern tienditas a secret to his neighbor friends. When he went back to Reno or Los Angeles to arrange deliveries, he always told friends that he was working in New York City, but in a small town like Jalisco, people talked. After a year in Columbus, his drivers went home for the fer Feria del Elote, Elote and started bragging about the great heroin market they were working up in central Ohio. By the fall of 1999, two more crews were in Columbus. One belonged to a former driver, now venturing out on his own. Two more followed. A kind of go east young man, Ethos, took hold among the Jalisco boys. The price of heroin in Columbus fell. No crew leader could cut his dope unless he wanted to lose his clients, so the product stayed strong even as it got cheaper. Competition, as always, attuned the Jalisco crews to customer service. They even crossed the city to keep a customer and gave away free dope to any client, hinting at quitting. One woman I met lived 25 miles outside Columbus, and at one point she hadn't called to buy for three days. A Jalisco boy called her. Senorita, why haven't you been buying recently? I don't have any money, she said. He drove out to deliver $50 worth of heroin to her, for which he required no payment. No, it's free, he said. He wanted to keep me using and buying from him, she said. She did both. A year or so after the man settled in Columbus, he drove to Charlotte looking for bigger profits. Addicts told him he would make a million there. No one there had seen anything like black tar heroin. Heroin, in fact, had only a small market in Charlotte. He met junkie contacts at the town's methadone clinic and gave them free samples. Soon business boomed again. He pulled a driver out of Columbus and another out of Nashville, and they set up the black tar heroin franchise in Charlotte. A couple weeks later, the Sanchez family from the ranchos near Jalisco arrived. They had an addict guide of their own, a big Native American fellow. The Sanchez... Sanchez's owed their expanding heroin empire to addicts. Addicts had guided the family out of San Fernando to Las Vegas, then to Memphis and Nashville, and from there to Charlotte. The man didn't know them, only knew of them. They were cousins of the late David Tejeda, from the rancho of Achilles Sardan down to the road from down the road from Jalisco. Now they were in Charlotte too. It was bound to happen. It was a free market after all. Have a good day, friends.